God, we ask that you make your presence known here, that everyone here would know that they are loved and known by you. We give you this morning, we give you this time, and it's in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Our passage this morning takes place in the middle of another story. So Jesus is on his way around Galilee and he is asked to come and heal a man's daughter. And as he's on his way to go to the little girl, this story occurs. So hear the word of the Lord from Luke chapter 8. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. There are so many great stories in the Gospels. And as a pastor, it is such an honor to read some of these stories, to preach from them, and some of them just stick out, and this is one of those stories for me. Who is this woman? Her story is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but we don't know her name. She's not given a name, but we do know a few things about her. We know she's been suffering from abnormal bleeding that no one can the Gospels of Matthew and Mark tell us that this is from hemorrhages. Mark adds that she endured much under many physicians, but she spent all she has, and that despite all of it, she's only grown worse. We also know that this has been going on for 12 years. This is not a new illness for her. This is not something she's thinking might go away. This is a chronic something she's dealt with for a long time, and those of us who know someone or have gone through it ourselves, who've dealt with a chronic illness, you know how this kind of thing holds on. And it kind of changes you, right? It affects not only your physical being, but your emotions and your thoughts and your whole being. One thing that sticks out is that this woman's illness seems to be uniquely feminine. To be bleeding for 12 years but not die from it gives us a clue that maybe her illness is from her womb. But this has to do with her female body. And that's something that we cannot avoid in the story, which makes this story rather unique. That this femaleness is so apparent and we cannot escape it. One thing that is not so obvious, though, from a 21st century Western lens when we read this story is that this woman, because of her illness, would have been considered unclean. She would have had a whole other social aspect to this illness in addition to the physical one because she would be considered uh, continually unclean, similar to being a leper. She has something that she cannot fix. She cannot go to the temple and be cleansed from it. And so she has to be removed from community. She cannot live with her family. She cannot live in society. She cannot be a part of religious life. She is completely removed because she is unclean. And if she touched anyone or even their clothes, she would spread this uncleanliness to them. So she would therefore be isolated, not able to touch or be touched for 12 years. So this leaves us with some questions. 
questions about her. First one I think of is, does this mean that this woman was never able to marry? Because the average lifespan of a woman in Jesus' day was between 30 and 50 years. If she's had this for 12 years, that's a good portion of her life. But if it started before she had a chance to get married, then it would definitely mean she couldn't ever get married. If she had married, another question that comes up is, did she have children? Or did this illness keep her from being able to? If she had a husband and children when this all started, she would have had to leave them. And she'd been gone for 12 years from her family, unable to see them or be with them. What has this illness taken from her? If that wasn't enough, the Gospel of Mark says that she spent all her money on doctors. She's got nothing left at this point. She's done. So what is she left with? What option does she have? But she hears of this rabbi. He's traveling around and has given sight to the blind. And has healed the sick. She thinks, maybe, maybe this is my chance. The Gospel of Mark, Mark 5, 28, records her words, but if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. If I just touch his clothes, I will be made well. So she comes into the city center, into the crowd of people, a place where she is not allowed to be. And she comes anyway. And this crowd is so dense that Luke says that they're almost crushing Jesus. There's so many people here. And this woman who is not allowed to be here has come. This woman who is unclean and not allowed to touch anyone is touching everyone around her in a desperate attempt to get to Jesus. And she reaches out and touches his cloak. And immediately she So then here's the other unique thing about this story. The first one is you can't escape the femaleness of the story. It's right there in the middle. The second thing is this miracle is kind of a stolen miracle. Up till now we've seen Jesus heal people, and he's chosen to heal people because of their faith, or the faith of someone in their family or in their household, or Jesus has chosen to heal someone when their faith has nothing to do with it. And it's simply out of his own compassion. But here, this woman takes the initiative and touches Jesus and she is healed by him without him ever even knowing it until it happened. Isn't that kind of bizarre? I never really noticed that about this story before until this week. This miracle is stolen, which I just find fascinating. Verse 44 says, She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has left me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. She's got to fess up now. She has nowhere to hide. She knows that she, the unclean one, has reached out and touched a rabbi. She knows that she's in trouble. She's got to come forward. But instead of rebuking her, this rabbi listens to her. He lets her tell her story. A woman who is out in public without a male escort, a woman who is unclean, a woman who has now touched a man she's not related to without his consent is listened to and given space to tell her story in public, in a time where the public space belonged to men only. I mean, this is a remarkable story because Jesus makes room for this woman to proclaim her story to everyone. Even today, there are people who would keep women from speaking in, in front of God. But Jesus here is very clear. He stops and waits to hear her voice describing her transformation. 
proclaiming her redemption to everyone who's there. Then the woman, seeing she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. So Jesus restores this woman's health with one touch and one instance. Her health is restored. And at the same time, that her physical health is restored, her community is restored, her religious life is restored, her family life is restored. She can now go back to her life. In this one instant, so much of her life that has for 12 years been put on hold or completely changed or she thought she'd lost is now restored. And the story ends with Jesus calling her daughter. This woman who for 12 years has been called nothing but unclean by religious leaders is now called daughter by this traveling rabbi. So I looked this word up in the Greek. We'll put it up on the screen. But the Greek word for daughter in this passage and in Matthew and in Mark is thugadar. Want to say that with me? Two daughter. There you go. Perfect. I actually don't know if it sounds perfect, but we'll just go with that. <laughs> so it's the word for someone's literal daughter. It's not the word for a woman that you have affection for or that you're thinking kindly of. This is the word that actually says, this person is my family. And I think that's interesting. Because I don't think Jesus said that by mistake. But when I looked up this word, thugadar, in the Greek English lexicon that's most commonly used by scholars in the United States, called the Laonida lexicon, that says this about this word here. Since this would imply that Jesus was acknowledging that the woman was in fact his own daughter, an obvious adjustment must be made in such instances. And therefore, one may use instead such expressions as lady or my dear woman to indicate a woman for whom there is some affectionate concern. In other words, although Jesus calls her family, you can just ignore that and just know that he has some affection towards her. So my Greek professor at seminary laid down some ground rules, and one of them was you don't question Laonida. Just take it as perfect. But I've got to say, I want to break that rule this morning. <laughs> because I don't think Jesus said this on accident. I don't think Jesus mistakenly called her family or daughter. I think this was a purposeful choice. This woman, this story about her is not just one about her health being restored. It's not just one about her family life being restored or her community life or her religious life being restored. The story is about identity. This woman has been called unclean for 12 years. That word has determined everything about her life. Unclean has determined her living situation, her isolation from community, her religious life, her lack of family, everything she spends her money on, the fact that no one could touch her, unclean has been how others see her, and no doubt how she sees herself. Unclean has been her identity. And yes, this story is about restored health and community and family, but the story is also about restored identity. Where you were once called unclean, Jesus seems to say, I call you family. Where you were once known as untouchable, I'm now saying, you're my daughter. Your illness may have a lot of power, but it does not have the power to determine your identity. If God calls you daughter, then that is what you are. Jesus uses a weird word here. Calling her his literal daughter. I think he does it on purpose. 
to restore her identity as a child of God. And I was reminded this week uh, of just how personal this story seems to be for women in general. Every time I've talked to a woman about this story throughout my life, every single one of them seems to have some connection to it. Like, this story has stood out among stories about Jesus for some reason. And it feels like that to me. It feels personal. And I was trying to think, why is that? And I think it's because when I read this story and I hear her issues with her body, I'm reminded of my own. And so many of us women understand suffering at the hands of our bodies. So many of us can connect to going to doctor after doctor and having no one believe you or no one listen to you or no one be able to help you. I think we think of our own troubles with our bodies when we hear her story. We think of our own illnesses that are so common. And we wonder if she suffered something like I suffered or we've suffered, or are suffering. Why does this passage speak so personally to women? Maybe this passage speaks to women personally because it speaks to our identity in Jesus. Maybe this passage speaks to women personally because as women, we've heard the message that to be female is to be unclean. Because if someone lusts after you, it's your fault, your issue, your body that needs to be taken care of, not theirs. Maybe this passage speaks to women personally because we've been taught to hide our femininity and the natural goings on of our bodies feeling shame if it's ever noticed. Maybe this passage speaks to women personally because it shows us that in light of all of that, Jesus is not repulsed or ashamed by her in this story. He does not cringe or shrink back from her. He doesn't attempt to hide her. Maybe this passage speaks to women personally because Jesus listens to her and gives her dignity by making room for her to tell her own story, for everyone to hear. Maybe this passage speaks to women personally because Jesus responds not by calling her unclean, but by calling her daughter. To be called daughter, to be called unclean, brings dignity to pain wholeness and brokenness. To be called daughter when you've been called that queen, you have something inside of you that speaks to your soul. To be called daughter when you've been called unclean begins to tear away the effects of years of judgment and shame for being female. To be called daughter when you've been called unclean makes you realize that you do not need to hide or shrink or relegate yourself to certain space to be called daughter when you've been called unclean changes your understanding of who you are and who you've been told to be. To have God call you daughter reminds you that woman is an honorable title to hold. This passage speaks to women, I think, because it revolutionizes how we understand God to interact with women and their distinctly feminine problems. With love and acceptance, Jesus calls her daughter. And although this passage seems to speak to so many women personally, it's not just for women. The women of the Bible have a lot to teach all of us. And I think all of us can, can find something from her story that speaks to us. Because it's about identity and restoration. In God's kingdom, we all belong. It's not a mistake that you're called a child of God. It's not a mistake that you've been called family. God doesn't just simply have a mild affection towards you. God actually says, son, daughter, child, on purpose. We don't need to mistranslate it. <laughs> to get that message across. What identity have you been holding on to that needs to be restored? Maybe it's an identity given by an illness. 
or specific suffering. Maybe it's an identity given to you by someone else or a community. And you held on to it. It is not your true identity to hold. Jesus is calling you, giving you space to tell your story. To think through this. And Jesus is calling you child. As believers, as those baptized into Jesus, our first and primary identity is as children of God. As a part of the family. So as we finish this time together this morning, take some time right now to ponder this story. What identity might you be clinging on to that you want Jesus to restore? What have you been holding on to that you want the Holy Spirit to work in you so that you can know your true identity as a child of God? Take some time this morning.